thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I'm going to give people a few more minutes to get online. It's a pleasure to be here with you. We've made it to February 23rd, and that's exciting in and of itself. Looks like the numbers seem to be tapering off. So with that, thank you again for joining us. Today's latest media briefing on important healthcare issues in the news as hosted by the Ontario Medical Association. As we all know by now, I am Dr. Samantha Hill. I'm the current president of the Ontario Medical Association. We represent more than 43,000 doctors and medical students across the province, and we're here to make sure you have the right answers to the right questions. This week, we're going to talk about how we can avoid the third wave of COVID, or more likely, how we can mitigate it and what we can do to make it the last wave and ensure that when we reopen, this time we reopen safely for everyone. I know everyone's really excited about the recent drop in COVID-19 cases, and it's really good news. When we think about the fact that at one point there were projections of 40,000 people a day, new cases, we are in a remarkably better place than we could have been. And every single doctor I know who practices emergency medicine, primary care, or heck, any kind of medicine here in Ontario is breathing a sigh of relief that we didn't see that come true. But the conversation has shifted a little bit, and now we're talking about the new variants of concern. And these variants already account for at least 7 to 10% of the confirmed cases. And at the rate that they're growing, we expect them to be the dominant strain of COVID in Ontario by mid-March. It's important to realize why that is important. And that is because we know that the new variants are potentially much more infectious. They haven't shown any demonstration of being more lethal or particularly more harmful. But if a great number more people are getting infected, a great number more people are going to need hospital care, critical care, and unfortunately, a great number more people are going to succumb. So it's important to understand that given that it takes a while for an infected person to show symptoms, pandemic decisions are currently being made using our best available evidence, but those case numbers reflect a situation that is several weeks old. It takes even longer when the tests are done for the variants and the results are reported. And what all of that means is that we could well be into a third wave long before we see the daily case count start to rise. The government framework developed last fall was for the original strain. It does not reflect the new variants, which as I've said, are more infectious. And that's a concern. Ontario's doctors have appealed to the government to continue pandemic restrictions until the data shows us how and where the variants are spreading. We've recently gotten all of our kids back to school and I know we'd all like them to stay in school. So today we have three esteemed physician colleagues with us to discuss what everyone can do, governments and the public, to avoid a third wave. And if we can't avoid it, how can we mitigate it? How can we make it the last wave? We're going to discuss the new variants, why they're important and how they're impacting the plans in front of us. We're going to define COVID fatigue. What is COVID fatigue? How do we stay motivated to continue following public health advice a full year into this pandemic? We're all weary, this is important. And finally, reopening. How do we reopen safely? How do we do so safely for everyone, including those racialized communities hardest hit by the pandemic? So allow me to introduce the four amazing colleagues with me today who are gonna tackle the hard parts of those questions. Dr. Lawrence Lowe, Medical Officer of Health for Peel Region. Dr. Larissa Matukas, Infectious Disease Consult and Head of the Division of Microbiology at St. Michael's in Toronto. Dr. Ariel Delphin, Psychiatrist at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto and Head of the Perinatal Mental Health Program and Perinatal Mental Health Telemedicine Program. And finally, Dr. Kwajo Kuramentang, a Critical Care and Palliative Care Physician at the Ottawa Hospital. I'm going to start by asking Dr. Lowe, can you please talk to us about your thoughts? How do we mitigate this third wave? Thank you, uh, Dr. Hill. Uh, thank you, esteemed colleagues, and thank you, media, for the opportunity uh, to provide some thoughts around really one thing that we are all trying to avoid, which is another wave of the COVID-19 pandemic in the province of Ontario. We've now been through two waves 
which has seen both and exacted a significant toll uh, on our communities in terms of our mental health and well-being, in terms of our connections, our economy, um, and certainly uh, the ability uh, for us to really engage and interact with each other in the way that we normally would. And so especially at this critical juncture, it is important to talk about what we can do to avoid or mitigate a third wave. A dose of realism would actually suggest that avoiding a third case surge is or resurgence of COVID-19 in our communities is likely uh, not possible. Uh, there is likely going to be uh, some sort of resurgence, especially as we start to emerge. So the first and most critical principle in engaging any sort of reopening is to ensure that we are moving gradually. It's for this reason that I took uh, the very difficult decision to request that my region remain in a stay at home order for an additional two weeks in recognizing that it would have been exactly three working days between the time that our students had returned to school and the community interaction changes that were related to that and what was originally proposed for our community to enter the provincial reopening framework. So I think it's certainly important uh, to highlight that moving gradually, as we say in medicine, starting low and going slow is really the first and fundamental principle in any sort of move forward. The second thing that is going to be a, a significant uh, component of avoiding and mitigating a third wave will be our vaccine rollout. Uh, we do know that it is very much a race between the variants and the vaccine and to the extent that remaining uh, gradually uh, and reopening gradually will allow us to uh, mitigate and hopefully minimize the spread of, of variants that have been seen elsewhere uh, in the world. Uh, it will also get us closer to greater vaccine availability and hopefully coverage. So certainly to the extent to which we're able to uh, push vaccine out to cover vulnerable populations, to cover the whole population, especially to reach out to, to communities that may have difficulty accessing the vaccine. Those are all gonna be key components into mitigating a third wave. And finally, the last piece really speaks to an ongoing adherence to uh, limiting contact interactions. And to the extent that we, that starts with our border and the new measures that have been brought in place with the border, um, which wouldn't have helped us in the first wave because most of our disease originally came from the United States. I think that was very clear. Um, and I think border restrictions would have uh, been very challenging at the beginning of 2020. But now that we know more and we see the variants, preventing the introduction of variants will be helpful. Uh, continuing to encourage adherence to the measures in terms of staying at home as much as possible, um, you know, uh, making sure that people are adhering to masking, distancing, hand washing, um, and only really uh, interacting for essential reasons. And then, of course, uh, making sure that we are providing the context and the situations uh, for essential workers to ensure that they're staying safe. Things like paid sick leave, uh, an expansion of uh, critical inspections in those sites, more rapid testing uh, in essential workplaces. Um, and also measures that are taken to quickly address outbreaks in those settings are all going to be critical in making sure that we address that. And finally, of course, the need to find, uh, test, trace, isolate, and treat uh, where all those measures fail and where we do still see transmission in our community. So there's a lot there to unpack and I'm looking forward to having a discussion with the rest of our panelists around uh, how uh, we continue to respond uh, as an overall community and as a physician and healthcare community to addressing a potential third wave. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. You've touched on a lot of important points there. The need to empower and follow the public health guidelines as they've come out over the last year. Nothing has really changed on those. The same things that worked for the old variants still work for the new variants. The need to improve our border, not necessarily control, I don't like that word, but our caution at the border and how we, how we uh, ensure that people coming in are safe to interact with other people. And of course, the idea that we need to move in a stepwise fashion. Let us see the results of one action before we take the next action. Things that all of us who practice medicine are very accustomed to doing. So thank you for saying it so clearly. Dr. Matukas, would you talk to us a little bit about how we can tackle the spread of these more contagious variants? Sure, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate today. Really appreciate to be here amongst all of these uh, great um, individuals. So thank you very much for having me. So um, we know that the new variants are here, these variants of concern, and we recognize that in fact, we will see new ones arise over time as well. It is inv invariable that that will happen, um, but 
if we see new emerging ones, we um, might make it harder to predict whether or not they will be more severe or even more easily transmissible. Our current provincial data that Dr. Hill already alluded to has shown that we have seen our current variants of concern continuing to rise. And in fact, this morning it's been updated from not just the seven to 10% that we saw most recently, but it's actually already increased to 14% of our COVID positives are now actually variants of concern. So we are seeing a trend that we are not happy to see. They are rising. One of the ways to actually try to tackle this is that we need to continue to test in order to be able to identify these. We need to be able to not just test for COVID, but to also test for the variants of concern. Although testing alone won't stop the spread of the variants, um, but in, com in combination with the public health measures that Dr. Lowe has outlined, we can really stop and end these waves. Some of the strategic um, opportunities that exist to really address the find and test of that sort of five-step process of find, test, trace, isolate, and treat or support um, we need to continue to follow those steps vigilantly, and a lot of those steps are actually dependent on one another. So the first step around testing and uh, finding those cases, we need to continue to mobilize uh, collection units that can be um, much more mobile and agile and nimble and to go into the areas where we are seeing these increasing rise of cases. We need to be able to create opportunities for individuals to participate in testing and make it much easier for patients to test, uh, such as changing the type of specimen collection away from nasopharyngeal swabs and introduce novel collection methods such as saliva. Uh, we need to improve our transportation system of specimens from collection sites to the lab, and we need to take advantage of the lab capacity that has continued to grow throughout the provincial network. There's lots of capacity and we need to make full use of it. We already know where the next wave is gonna take place. We've been following this carefully. We know that the vulnerable and high risk areas that we've seen previously in the first two waves continue to be areas that are vulnerable and high risk. To reiterate, these are congregate living areas such as shelters and correctional facilities and other group homes. We know about congregate care and the devastation that's happened across our long-term care homes. Education with the schools opening up and Dr. Lowe alluded to this already, we're going to see these outbreaks occurring in across our spectrum of education from childcare to schools to universities. And of course, even within workplaces where distancing between work shifts is difficult, and uh, that includes all industries, including food and even retail as well. And so if we continue to open up, we're going to continue to see these outbreaks and we're going to, con to continue to see these outbreaks, particularly in areas where it's difficult to adhere to the public health measures that we know actually work. So such as the gyms, the bars, the restaurants, the nightclubs, these will continue to have outbreaks if we allow them to continue to open and function. Given that we know that the variants are actually more transmissible right now, we should expect to see sort of additional super spreader events and probably even more than we had before. We've already witnessed this. We've seen this in the communities in the long-term care homes in Barrie. We've seen these within apartment buildings within Peel, and we've seen these within smaller communities such as in North Bay. But together we can really make a change and we can really be vigilant with all of these measures to really help guide what we do in order to mitigate this third wave. Thank you so much, Dr. Matukas. I mean, the end of that was really the key point that every single Ontarian needs to hear is that we all have a role to play. And as we do our part, we all make a difference. And I know that sometimes it seems overwhelming to the general public. It seems like there's nothing that one individual can do to make a difference, but all of these super spreaders, they start with one individual. And it's really important, not that we're blaming people, but that we all realize that we have a responsibility to others and that with these more contagious variants, there is the potential for more harm. Now, I know people are sort of thinking, we've heard concerns before, we've heard reports of a potential 40,000 by this time. And so people are kind of getting weary of it all. They feel like it's all just propaganda or fear mongering. And it's really important to remind everyone that the reason we didn't see those 40,000 cases is because people did what they had to do. Whether it was individual citizens or the governments making the difficult decisions for lockdowns or the individual public health units making difficult decisions, things were done to mitigate that outcome. And those are the same kind of things that we're talking about today is how do we mitigate the next horrible outcome? How do we make sure that doesn't come to fruition? As I say, 
the best sign that you've done the right thing in a pandemic is that people think you've overreacted. So with that, I'll turn to Dr. Delphin. Dr. Delphin, could you please talk a little bit about this COVID pandi pandemic fatigue? <laughs> Sorry, um, people are weary. What can we do to overcome that weariness? And what can we do to really double down on the efforts needed to curb COVID? Why is it so important? Absolutely. Thank you so much for including me on the panel today and really including a perspective from mental health and behavioral health, which a term we don't often use in Canada, but I think is so salient here. Um, and, and as we all know, we're hearing from, I'll use the word esteem because that's the best word to, to use today, very esteemed, knowledgeable colleagues who are all on the front lines working day to day, yet somehow with all this information, top-notch data, somehow something is getting lost in translation. And this is because we know and we understand that health behaviors and health beliefs are extremely complex issues that are multifactorial and based on so many different factors. And now we're dealing with pand pandemic fatigue despite all these numbers and these very striking concerning numbers. And I think what we saw at first was that fear was motivating people, the unknown and people were acting because we didn't know. But what's happened over the past 11, almost 12 months is that pandemic fatigue has sunk in. And just so we're all on the same page, the way I understand and, and, and define that is really looking at the natural and expected responses to the ongoing intense life with adversity and life with an in, within an intense public health crisis. And the symptoms of this are feeling complacent, maybe feeling hopeless, feeling helpless, and unmotivated to follow when we desperately still need to be following all these preventative measures. And I think it's really important to look at this from a psychological perspective and understand that people's health behaviors and decisions are really impacted by their own personal, religious, cultural um, and social and governmental factors. And um, I think a lot of the things that can really help address this are some of the things that we're talking about today and looking at the solutions to to pandemic fatigue from each of these perspectives. And today, as Dr. Lowe and Dr. Matukas has said, really having clear, consistent uh, information is a big part of it. And as you mentioned before, not shaming people, not blaming people. And I think a really important component also is to look at um, and, and, and convey a sense of empathy to people and a sense that, yes, this is really hard. Life is super hard. You've had many losses, you've had many changes and you still do, but we still need to keep doing this. So really strongly conveying from a psychological perspective and trying to understand the losses and the need to go on and trying to hold both of these different factors together and at the same time giving people some really concrete strategies as we do as physicians such as still trying to connect with each other but in a safe way still still trying to reduce risk um, and still trying to find ways on a personal level to live a satisfying and fulfilling life and maintaining some hope. And one key thing that I find these days that I'm always saying to patients who I see is we do know spring will come. And yes, that may mean numbers, but we do know that may mean sunny days, warmer days, the options to get outside. And we know how to manage COVID a little bit better in warmer weather. And it's a little more pleasant. So I'm happy to get into a little more detail on some strategies uh, that I would suggest, but I think, but I think it's so important to be talking about pandemic fatigue and how to get around it so that we can all move forward and we can all get this really in our rear view mirror. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Delphin. I could not have said it better myself. People are struggling. We were in a mental health crisis long before we were in a COVID crisis and COVID has not made it any better, um, nor have any of the measures we've had to take to keep people safe during COVID. And so it is not surprising. It's entirely predictable that people are struggling from a mental health perspective. And I love the term behavioral health perspective. There is a human tendency when things seem overwhelming to just give up. And right now things seem overwhelming for a lot of people. And so it's exactly what we're here today to talk about is why it's not as overwhelming as it 
feels, why there are things that we can all do and how we can do those things to move forward. So thank you. Dr. Kiramantang, can you please speak to us a little bit about how to reopen safely for all Ontarians? We've seen very discrepant outcomes a disproportional effect in racialized communities as well as in other vulnerable communities. Even within hot spots, there are hotter spots and calmer spots. So how do we safely reopen for everyone? And how do we protect those who've been disproportionately affected so far? I uh, really want to thank you, Dr. Hill, for the opportunity to speak to this. And uh, just want to give uh, a lot of um, respect for our, sorry, sorry for the background noise. I, I don't think they know that I'm in a meeting now. But um, I, I just want to emphasize how important this is that we are doing this ahead of the game to talk about strategies before it, is, it becomes an issue. Because I think this is one of the key things that Unfortunately, I think we we could we should be doing more of when it comes to our battle with COVID nineteen. It's talking about some of these issues before that there are problems. So, in terms of you know how to open safety, there's four key points that I think I wanted to emphasize. You know, actually five. One, ensuring that we have low community spread, which fortunately we're moving in that right in that direction where we're seeing globally that COVID cases are going down, um, which is fortunately uh, reassuring. Second point I, I wanna make is vaccine rollout. Uh, as Dr. Lowe mentioned, it, it is important to get these vaccines out, especially to our most vulnerable populace, especially when we realize how effective they are, not only in reducing spread, but um, reducing hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and, um, and, uh, and deaths. Um, so really, it comes to me getting the vaccine out, especially to our most vulnerable, I, I think it's important. When it comes to our, also to our disproportionately affected uh, area uh, patients, you know, there's the idea of vaccine hesitancy out there. Like a lot of, even within, the, I've done a few interviews regarding the BIPOC community in terms of their hesitancy in, 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 in taking the vaccine. And this is where I think the theme of compassion, no, like not shaming our, our, our public uh, is so important. I think I would get ahead of this. I would be engaging the community, community leaders and saying, how do we, uh, hey, how do we answer some of these concerns? I know for myself personally, I, 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 I took a, when I got my vaccine, I actually Put a picture out on social media for the like the one person actually to show that I had faith in the science, I had faith in the safety, and the and how important it was to to get vaccine out there. So um, I think we need to be ahead of this in terms of strategies to um, address hes hesitancy. And and once again, when it comes to the theme of communication, speak at their level. Who are the community leaders? Who are the people can reach out to that uh, whatever community we're talking about? Third point, isolation centers. I think this is really an undervalued um, um, intervention that we could use to be um, to, to, to approach reopening. I could give a, a, a nickel in Vermont, which has been a, a state that's done really well in terms of COVID-19 uh, mitigation. And what, what they do, you go to a test site, and if you're in a situation, you're high risk, say, uh, they, they deem that you're really worried that you might be, uh, you have COVID, you live in a multi-generational home and give you a voucher for a hotel on site. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to apply for, uh, you don't have to go through red tape. You don't have to log in somewhere. You get that voucher on site so that you do not bring COVID to a multi-generational home, bring it to grandma, who then was more likely that we see it to you, um, or hospitalized. Um, so strategies in terms of like there are isolation centers out there, but to promote them and to actually get rid of that red tape. Fourth, I, I can't emphasize the importance of, of paid leave. Like if you're in, a, uh, in a, a situation where you're in a factory worker and you do not have the, the resources to take time off for testing, okay? If you're positive, you, don't, you may or may not have a job two weeks later. Um, and so you have that added uh, barrier to be able to get tested and to, and to 
um, really uh, um, get assessed. And so it all stems from that. And, you know, once again, bringing that into a highly concentrated, you know, factory working environment where COVID has been spreading quite rapidly, I guess an important, uh, it's an important step. And then lastly, I'll say is just access to testing, you know, bring, bring testing. I think Dr. Mateek has mentioned this before, but bring testing to, to areas that are at highest risk of spread, I think is, is so important. Add that rapid testing element. Uh, add that um, the, the facilitate using, for example, saliva testing as opposed to, um, you know, nasopharyngeal. I think are all great points. And sorry, I think I might have ran a little bit long, but uh, once again, thanks for the opportunity. I think it's brilliant that we're doing this. Thank you so much for being here, and no worries about running a little bit long. I think people are here to hear what you have to say, so that's all good. The thing I would pull out from all the great points that you've made is the recognition that essential workers and people who are most affected often don't have access to job security or to paid sick days. And you've made a lot of good points, but I really want to flag that one again. It's something that the Ontario Medical Association has been really vocal about. You cannot ask people to make a decision between paying their rent or paying for their food for their families and protecting society. That's an impossible decision. So we do need to make progress on that. And I know we've tried and we will keep trying. So with that, thank you, Drs. Lowe, Matukas, Delphin, and Kiramantang. We are now going to open up our Q&A session. So I'll invite all of the reporters to put your questions in the Q&A chat. I see that there are already quite a few up there and we will start getting to them in a sequential order. If we don't get to your question due to time, the media team will certainly follow up with you. We will make sure every question is answered if it's live or in print later. You can also email us always at media at oma.org for requests for further information, additional requests for interviews with any of our panelists. And finally, we will have a recording of the session available later this afternoon, as always, in case you need to come back and confirm a point or you want to link to it. So with that, let's take our first question. Mr. Ray Chan, senior reporter from Tsingtao. Question to all of the doctors, he says, should Queen's Park or the local government set up restrictions to prevent cross zone region shopping activities or even cross province non-essential travel? Dr. Lowe, do you wanna take first stab at that? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Hill, and thanks Ray, for the question. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, it's really critical to emphasize that um, you know the trend, the travel from high transmission to low transmission areas presents a material risk uh, to communities outside, uh, particularly more rural and uh, northern communities uh, of additional spread, uh, especially with the variants in the in the uh, in our uh, midst. Um, and so I think to the extent that the provincial recommendation has been for quite some time to really try to limit uh, you know, any excursions outside the home to the most essential. Um, I don't know if, uh, if certainly if there is, uh, and there is good evidence and data to suggest that region hopping is occurring. Um, we also know that there are uh, challenges with instituting uh, uh, measures of, of you know, uh, blocking off specific regions or, or closing off uh, interprovincial travel. Um, but I think uh, to the extent that they should be considered and explored um, against any evidence and data that we have that they may be effective, then I hope that those conversations are at least happening. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. I think uh, the host and I are fighting for control of my mute button. Um, Dr. Delphin, did you want to add a comment to that? And then we'll go on to the next question. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly answer on the uh, in 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 terms of looking at that from a psychological perspective. I would totally agree with what Dr. Lowe is saying. It's confusing to people, and if it's open, people will go. And um, it's not because they're bad people. It's not because we want to again shame people because they think it's okay. I think people think governments have their best interests at heart, and. And, and that's where some of the confusion, I think, weighs in and the fatigue as to what can I do, what can I not do? If it's okay just north of this main street, why is it not okay with me? Sometimes those messages get lost and that leads to frustration and fatigue and not following the rules. Perfect, thank you. I will bring the next question over to Dr. Dr. Matukas, and the question from Rejmi Nair at CP24 is, what is it about Ontario specifically that makes us susceptible to a third wave? 
So I don't actually think that Ontario is unique compared to the rest of the country. Um, we are all sort of in the same kind of uh, precarious position right now where we have seen these variants of concern spread across the country. And we have seen pockets of this already starting to spread in particular congregate settings. I don't think that there is, as I said, anything specific about Ontario. But one of the things that we do continue to need to balance is this ability to be able to open up safely along with trying to contain the variants of concern if we move too quickly or if we open up too quickly, then it's quite clear that human behavior, as we've already discussed, is that if you can, you will. Um, and so what will happen is that the variant will definitely take that to its advantage and it will spread in those circumstances where we don't have really good measures in place to prevent its spread. So I'm not sure that it's anything specific to Ontario. It is something that we all have to struggle with and try to find that right um, at those right measures that will really help direct people to choose the safer options and to be really vigilant around those public health um, interventions. I don't think we can emphasize that enough. And I know that you've heard this for the past year, but it really is those public health measures of distancing, mask wearing, hand washing frequently, and if you're ill, staying home. And at this point, even if anybody in your household, if you are ill, everybody in your household should probably stay home as well. So I know uh, my colleague would like to add to that as well. So I'll stop there and pass it on. All right, thanks so much. And that colleague was Dr. Lowe who wanted to add to it. And Dr. Lowe, while you're adding to that, I'm also going to ask you to address the next question by Dr. Nair. Dr. Nair, I just um, either promoted you or demoted you, depending on how you feel about doctors. Um, but Mr. Nair, about are there provinces or countries you're watching right now to see how things unfold? Because I think you might have a line of sight on that as well. Absolutely. Uh, so I would I would highlight that uh, there is uh, nothing. I, I would agree with Dr. Matukas. There isn't anything that uh, makes us uh, immune or more susceptible to a third wave. It is just the nature of pandemics. I would argue uh, Ontario uh, is just uh, Ontario faces a lot of different contextual challenges uh, in its response. We are uh, the most populous province in the country. Uh, we did receive uh, you know uh, one of the larger seedings uh, in the first wave uh, by virtue of our significant connection with the New York metropolitan area, which saw a significant crisis in March uh, outside of uh, outside of the greater Toronto area, there are probably very few other metropolitan areas that were connected to the crisis in New York the way that uh, we were in March. I think the fact that the first wave went the way that it did for us in Ontario is actually quite a bit of a testament, I think, to the response that we had given that context. Um, but I think really just highlighting the challenge that a disease that spreads from person to person uh, that is exacerbated by inequities, uh, particularly seen in my region where, you know, we are essentially the distribution and manufacturing hub uh, for all of Canada. Um, you know, everything comes in through Pearson that gets fanned out uh, and the patterns have really followed as uh, typical other large federated states uh, the large more populous international facing jurisdictions get it first and then secondary centers get it second and then the more remote areas start to then see spread uh, out of those connections which is what we're seeing in Newfoundland um, I think that's where I, I think we, we continue to have those challenges because we just have more people and we have more interactions. But all that to say, Newfoundland is a jurisdiction that I think is highly instructive in respect of how quickly the variants can make a wave uh, go out of control, particularly if uh, you know measures are not lifted gradually. And so besides Newfoundland, Western Europe's experience is fairly instructive. And these are all jurisdictions that in respect of uh, fighting a third wave, we continue uh, to monitor. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Dr. Karamantang, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just a quick point that um, the, the one thing I would say in terms of what makes places unique, and, and this is just my humble opinion, is as Dr. Lowe has mentioned, you, areas that are like high concentrations of essential workers, high concentrations of multi-generational homes, we're seeing those are, those are the areas that are being hardest hit. Like I live in Ottawa right now where 70% of people have government jobs and can much easier stay home. And we've never been overrun. We haven't been hard hit. And I think it says a lot about um, the, the nature of a city or a region based on the, uh, you know, the number of essential workers, multi-generational homes, and for the reasons that we clarified in the, uh, in the press. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn to the question from Holly Mackenzie Sutter at the Canadian Press next. Are there any changes to the current framework and other projections that doctors would recommend on top of the current rules in Ontario? And I know the OMA has released the news release on that very item, but I suspect our esteemed colleagues here have things to add. So why don't we start with um, Dr. Matukas and then I'll flip it over to whoever wants to answer next. 
Um, sorry, I got kind of lost there in the questions. <laughs> I'm trying to find the questions just so I can remind myself of the details. My um, apologies. I stopped going in order because yeah. there were so many questions. Um, any changes to the current framework or other projections, protections that you would recommend on top of the current rules in Ontario? Yeah, so it's, that's a really great question. And it's something that we continue to look at um, to see what else we can, what other mitigating measures we can be putting in place in order to really get on top of not just the current strains that are circulated, but even these new variants that are starting to, um, to rise as well. Um, right now, the evidence is that we really should just be very vigilant with the current measures that we have in place. As I mentioned, uh, all of the personal protective equipment that we, that we currently use to protect ourselves is actually working very very well, but any small breach in it will actually, in fact, allow that virus to take advantage of that breach and move forward. And it may not even be a breach that you recognize or that it's intentional in its in its nature. Um, and so it really is is really being very mindful of wearing your masks properly. Uh, when you are sitting down to have your lunch and you're at work and you have to share that space with your coworkers to really make sure that you've identified that you've spaced yourselves appropriately and not just within the workplace, but then even congregating as you leave your workplace. So those breaks that you take outside or the breaks that you take or as you all leave the building to go home, it's really, really important that we continue to maintain that physical distancing and continue to wear our masks and continue to hand wash. Apologies, I lost my mute button there for a moment. Um, thanks, Dr. Kiramantang, did you want to add to that? No, I've caught you off guard, I apologize. <laughs> Sorry, I was reading the French. French Sorry. Um, I, I think it was Dr. Mo that wanted to comment, actually. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no worries. Uh, and I think uh, this is going back to the provincial framework and question. Uh, I think there's a few things, uh, certainly, that uh, we've made very clear uh, just in terms of the limits and the thresholds uh, that were identified. Uh, they, they do seem to be uh, sort of out of keeping with evidence and with what other uh, institutions and jurisdictions have put forward. I think one other thing that maybe should start being included in the framework just for consideration is also some of the other key policy measures that have been, I think all of us as all of our panelists have talked about paid sick days and the importance of worker protections. Um, you know, even if, so if the issue is that uh, you don't want to do it permanently on a permanent policy basis, then maybe within a certain zone or within a certain color, then you actually put that in there. Uh, I mean, that's one thing that could be looked at. I think the other thing is also looking at assistance for businesses. Part of a lot of the disquiet amongst businesses at this point in time is the fact that they're just not getting relief that they need to. Um, and so looking at how relief can be scaled on a sort of sliding basis to uh, where you are uh, within the more restrictive measures of the framework uh, might also be another way And having that clear and publicized together with the requisite programs to support uh, impacted uh, you know, staff and businesses could be another aspect of the framework that could be included. And finally, the last thing is just also looking at um, the rationale behind some of the pieces. So certainly in the red category, uh, where um, you know you've got dining uh, with ten indoors and gyms in indoors, but at certain levels, again, it speaks to the thresholds, uh, maybe needing to be revisited. So either the thresholds or the measures within them, uh, you know, just making sure that they uh, correspond to evidence and data and what we understand so far about the disease. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And so just to flag for the media, the OMA has also recommended um, banning indoor dining in regions in the red zones and any other maskless indoor activities with non-household members. We encourage residents to support local businesses by ordering takeout or doing things that involve curbside pickup rather than in-store shopping. And of course, that means encouraging retailers to offer that. In regions where indoor dining is permitted, only household members should be allowed to sit together at dining tables. And again, this is just recognizing the fact that when we take off our masks to eat, as we should all do a couple times a day, that there is a risk of an asymptomatic person spreading to another asymptomatic person. We need to keep a close eye on the spread of variants in order to determine whether we need to shorten the time that people can socialize outdoor without masks. Currently, it's recommended to be 15 minutes, but if these viruses, these new variants are as contagious as we think they might be, that might be too long still. And we'll need to watch whether the spread of variants overwhelms the existing rapid testing arrangements and ensure that there are plans in place to make sure that vaccines that come to us actually get into arms where they can do some good. 
I'm going to throw our next question. Um, we'll start with Dr. Lowe and then we'll go to Dr. Kiramantang. And this is a question from Miriam Edahia at Radio, Radio Canada. It must be Radio Canada. Sommes-nous à la troisième vague et est-ce que la réouverture des régions est trop tôt selon vous? Uh, merci, Mariam, pour, pour la question. Uh, et uh, à mon avis, je pense que c'était uh, très positif uh, que le gouvernement provincial ait uh, décidé de retarder la, la réouverture dans uh, la région de Peel. Uh, surtout, uh, le plus important, si, uh, si c'est très près uh, de, de, la, um, de la rentrée scolaire uh, dans, uh, dans notre communauté. Uh, mais je pense que uh, dans, uh, mes, dans mes uh, remarques uh, préliminaires, uh, je pense que le plus important message est, uh, de, de, um, est de déconfiner uh, progressivement. Uh, je, uh, nous, nous, nous savons que uh, la, la vitesse de propagation des variants uh, dépend de la rapidité avec, uh, avec um, uh, laquelle, um, avec, uh, avec laquelle les contacts augmentent uh, dans notre communauté. Et uh, nous, uh, nous uh, savons additionnel, additionnellement que uh, si les, les tendances uh, dans notre communauté sont favorables, uh, il y a des, des variants uh, et uh, se multiplient uh, beaucoup. Um, et, uh, et pour ces raisons, uh, nous devons, uh, nous devons uh, um, déconfiner avec, uh, avec beaucoup de pré précautions, uh, avec uh, les expériences de, uh, dans, les, uh, dans des pays, pays uh, en, uh, en Europe et aussi en Terre-Neuve. Uh, ici, ce sont des expériences uh, très instructives et, et, uh, et pour cette raison, je suis, je suis très positif uh, avec, um, avec le, les décisions récentes de la gouvernement provincial. Merci. Dr. Karamantang? Uh, moi, je ne parle pas aussi beau que Dr. Lowe, mais uh, je vais juste ajouter peut-être deux choses. Moi, les choses ont besoin de penser de ça, c'est il y a des conséqu conséquences, conséqu conséquences de, de, de ne pas ouvrir. Et puis, comme on dit ça toujours, comme le mental health, uh, um, um, on avait dans la première vague, uh, delayed cancer diagnosis, delayed screening, tout ça. Alors, moi, j'aime le, le, le concept de, de faire toutes choses progressively, comme progressivement, genre, euh, tranquillement. Et puis, si ça ne marche pas, on a besoin de euh, ch changer notre euh, stratégie. On a besoin de peut-être retirer euh, qu'est-ce qu'on qu 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 fait. Alors, euh, mais, mais mon opinion, si dans beaucoup de régions dans la Provence, je pense que c'est une bonne idée, mais euh, euh, ça, c'est mon opinion. Je pense que tu as très bien fait, Dr. Kiremontang. J'ajouterais juste que à l'Association médicale d'Ontario, les médecins ont demandé au gouvernement de maintenir les restrictions, c'est-à-dire qu'on pense que c'est un peu trop vite. Et on a demandé cela dans la plupart des régions de l'Ontario pour une coupe de semaines davantage afin d'éviter la troisième vague. Nous restons préoccupés par les dangers potentiels qui sont posés par les nouvelles variantes qui sont plus contagieuses et nous croyons que les nouvelles variantes feront la majorité des cas de COVID en Ontario d'ici la mi-mars, um, c'est-à-dire là où le printemps commence à y arriver. Et nous savons aussi qu'elles sont déjà présentes dans de nombreux foyers de soins de longue durée à Toronto et comme vient d'être décrit par le docteur Matukas, sont déjà à 14 Alors, nous comprenons que le public est fatigué de la pandémie et certains ont appelé à une modération des restrictions vu que le nombre de cas par jour diminue, mais moi je dirais qu'il faut qu'on fait attention. On sera dans la troisième vague avant qu'on sait qu'on y est. Et les numéros qu'on suivait, ça fait une couple de mois, ce ne sont pas les mêmes numéros qu'il faut qu'on suive, ce ne sont pas les mêmes chiffres qu'il faut qu'on suive aujourd'hui. Aujourd'hui, il faut vraiment être attentif au pourcentage des nouvelles variantes et la vitesse avec laquelle ils s'augmentent. Et d'aller de 7% à 14%, ça, c'est un grand change important. All right, back to the Anglophone viewers and media. Um, so the next question I'll throw out to Dr. Delphin as I thought it was a great question. Um, this is from Dr. Luke Hendry. Uh, sorry, I keep 
Everyone's a doctor today. This is from Mr. Luke Hendry, the Intelligencer newspaper in Belleville. Much of the public reaction to COVID stories involves resistance to measures based upon two things, concerns about the economics and the other negative impacts of restrictions and a lack of belief in scientific evidence and statements from experts. How do you respond to such reactions apart from what we've already said? Well, thanks so much, uh, Luke, for the question, and thanks for asking, Samantha. I'm not sure that I have a, uh, a ton of extra to add, which is for better or for worse, when a problem is a little bit wet, more well circumscribed, we all know it's a little bit easier to address, even though this is a complex one. Um, I, I think it gets back to the fact that we really haven't fully addressed those issues, and we really haven't fully cracked the nut on why some people at some times um, are, are still holding on to those beliefs and uh, aren't able to move forward at maybe as a society, maybe in certain cultural groups, maybe. Um, I think we're not able to, or we haven't yet, maybe as physicians, maybe on a governmental level, been able to really fully understand what is behind those beliefs. The economics is relatively easy to understand, but the ability to maybe hold all of those things at once and why in certain groups or certain individuals, certain families or cultural groups, because we know that all of these influence people, I don't think we've done enough digging to try and understand and to try and target messages to them to get around or to you to borrow from another area of mental health and substance use and addiction, which is looking at some risk mitigation strategies or harm reduction strategies um, that may be more useful and more valid to use in certain populations. And again, it gets back to a lot of things that my colleagues have said is looking at those larger ways that governments can intervene in terms of economic support, in terms of educational support, and very concrete things, um, but being able to hold these different ideas together at once. And I, I don't know that we've done a good enough job to try and understand the particular variables and vulnerabilities, to communicate that, and to really come up with meaningful and adequate solutions as opposed to an all or nothing. Um, because none of us is an all or nothing person and we all have these factors working on us. So to really make inroads and, and address these people's concerns or all of our concerns, I, I think it's incumbent upon us to do a little bit more digging and deeper understanding of, of fears and psychology and, um, and a, a whole range of factors. Thank you, Dr. Dolphin. I'll just add to that, that this conversation about economics versus health has to stop being phrased that way. You cannot have economic recovery in the middle of a pandemic. If we lifted all of the restrictions and just let the pandemic run its course, there would be economic devastation. And we cannot have recovery of healthcare and recovery of our well being um, in the absence of an economic recovery. And so we've said this from the very beginning, but I feel like it's important to keep saying it. These two items are essentially tied. Your mental health and your physical health are tied to your financial well being. And that is true for the entire province. I am being signaled by people that we have way more questions than we have time to answer if we keep going through them at this level of density. So from here on in, I will try and keep my comments to a minimum and I'll throw out questions to one respondent at a time. So back to that first question that's on the list from Rejmi Nair at CP24. What would some of the differences or challenges be if the UK variant becomes the dominant version here in Ontario? And Dr. Matukas, I haven't heard from you in a while, so let's throw this one to you. Sure. So I think one of the things that you've already mentioned is like when it becomes a dominant strain, and it's really important for us to be able to identify when it does become a dominant strain. So I think that investing in our lab capacity in order to actually follow and trace what's actually happening with these types of strains is, is critically important so that we can act as quickly and as, as agile as possible. Um, that does mean that we do have that lab capacity. And as I already said before, we need to continue to be creative um, in opening up that lab capacity to test not just for COVID, but for the different strains. Um, I think I saw some other questions sort of in the Q&A around, well, how do we actually ensure that that's happening? And is there a lag between the lab reporting um, and it getting out into the public and into the data sets to be, um, to be 
accounted for. Um, certainly, we have done an incredible job across the province in developing our lab capacity and also developing our lab capacity specifically to identify the variants of concern. There are multiple labs that are now testing as a screen the variant of concern um, from all the positive COVID samples. And then we are also expanding our ability to do genetic sequencing, which is actually not just to monitor the current strains that are circulating, but to identify when those newer ones become um, available and in circulating in our population as well. So what are the some of the things that we can do differently? We definitely need to keep on top of what strains are circulating, and we definitely need the lab capacity in order to do so and the additional techniques in order to be able to differentiate between all the different strains that are circulating. That was a great answer, Dr. Matukas. I'm going to throw the next question to Dr. Lowe, and I'm actually going to combine the two questions from Holly McKenzie Souter at the Canadian Press. So the first question is on variants. Modeling predicts that variants will become dominant by mid-March, but PHO, Public Health Ontario, is still catching up on testing for these variants. Do doctors expect the data will ref reflect the prevalence of the variants by the time they become dominant, or will there be a lag? And then the second question was that about lifting restrictions and risk. York Medical Officer of Health differed from their counterparts in Peel and Toronto, who are very well represented here, arguing that the variants are under control and that it's safe to lift the restrictions. So how does the public make decisions on their safety when there are such differing interpretations of evidence and approaches from officials? Well, I'll start with the last question first. Uh, one of the strengths of Ontario's public health system is the fact that we have 34 local public health units um, this allows us to have a clear line of sight and an understanding and an ability to engage with our communities, uh, which is very different when you have larger health authority sized health units and a real difficulty in actually getting down uh, into understanding the needs on the ground. So uh, it doesn't come as a surprise to me that uh, Dr. Kurji has made the you know, decisions and recommendations that he has for the region of York. Uh, he's operating in a different community uh, and his patterns may very well look different. I, I can't speak to what he's seeing. Uh, I have to make my decisions in Appeal on the basis of the fact that we have a lot of those, uh, you know, disenfranchised populations. We have uh, the largest manufacturing and distribution sector in the entire country. We have so many essential workers. Uh, our picture is vastly different. And for that reason, I think you'll, you'll see that to the extent that it will also help the vaccine rollout, because I've seen a lot of questions around that as well. Uh, it means that uh, health units who are most on the ground and able to understand where the community needs might be to work with those vulnerable groups, et cetera. I'm hoping that that will be uh, one of the saving graces in what has been otherwise a, a somewhat challenged uh, process so far. And then in respect of the uh, first question, uh, there will always be a lag. Uh, and I don't know if my lab colleague might actually be best to speak to this. But again, we're looking at a picture from ultimately two weeks ago uh, in, in the time that it takes for these diseases to incubate and then be tested and then quickly turned around. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's for that reason that precaution and uh, and that progressive approach to uh, um, I was going to say deconfinement, but to reopening uh, would be uh, uh, you know followed at least at this point in time, recognizing that the data doesn't always uh, uh, keep a pace uh, just by virtue of the way the disease spreads. Deconfinement sounds so much more appropriate, though, doesn't it, Dr. Matukas? You wanted to add a quick comment to that before we move on to the next question. Yeah, I'll just I'll just mention that you know our turnaround times for actually um, reporting out results for COVID have significantly improved over the course of the pandemic, and we are now seeing well over ninety percent of our test results uh, for COVID alone uh, being being reported in under forty eight hours, <clears throat> and in most jurisdictions, um, even sixty percent or more are being reported within twenty four. So a significant improvement in our turnaround time for COVID, and now that we've actually started our variant of concern testing, that screening is actually happening within 24 hours. We may not have that confirmation, which requires the sequencing that tells us the exact type of variant that's present, but we can at least distinguish very quickly within 24 hours of a positive COVID result, whether or not it is a variant or not. And so whilst there will always be a slight lag, we are doing everything that we can and have made significant strides to improve our, our test turnaround time and get those results into the hands of decision makers as fast as possible. Perfect. Thank you. My next question is going to go to Dr. Kiraman Tang, and that comes from Natalie Johnson at CTV News. Are you satisfied with Ontario's vaccine rollout thus far? Have the delays in distribution contributed to the potential severity of a third wave? Yeah, I think a, a lot of this, unfortunately, wasn't, wasn't in the hands of... Like, I'm a big believer of controlling what you can, you can control, and I know there were delays in, in distribution. I, I got to say, at I'm going to speak selfishly at the sites in Ottawa when it came to getting as many people vaccinated as soon as possible when they had 
vaccines in hand was incredible. Uh, so I, I just want to really commend uh, the folks at the civic site at the Ottawa Hospital for the, the work that they've done. I think, I, I, I mean, I just can't emphasize how important it is. Like to answer the question directly, I think if you, if you really want to reduce the risk of having this third wave, like the vaccines are so important. And not just, I, I like we're in a situation where I think I always approach it, who's being hardest hit? Who is, who's landing in ICU? and who's landing in hospital. And these are the people that need the vaccine because it's that effective. I look at the 70,000 plus that were, um, that were, uh, uh, that would receive the vaccines in the studies, for example, Moderna and Pfizer on, like literally nobody was in hospital. Like, like this is what kind of level of effectiveness we're talking about. So we really want to avoid that third wave, avoid overrunning our hospital, our hospital, our hospital system. This is a, this is a ticket. I mean, amongst many of the things that we talked about for sure, but like in terms of 80, 20 or bang for your buck. Wow. Like let's get those vaccines out. And the other thing too, so I mentioned earlier, I'm just going to say it again, address hesitancy now. Don't wait till, till the vaccines are in hand. Just it now and be ready on the ground. We have that plan already. Don't be caught up in the red tape of, you know, who's going to next, like just get it out as soon as possible and anticipate uh, who, who's going to need it. And um, really, this is not the time for politics. It's not the time for, you know, it's the time for the big, get, get the vaccines out to the, those that are in greatest need. Sorry if I sound very preachy, but I, I'm pretty passionate about that one. Never apologize for being passionate, Dr. K. All right, next question comes from Crystal uh, Oag. I apologize if I have pronounced that incorrectly, and it's for Dr. Lowe. Earlier, you said it's a race between the vaccine and the variants. The province is putting the onus on public health units to roll out the vaccine. And is that fair? Are public health units prepared for that rollout, or are we now losing more time as they work to plan? So public health units have been planning uh, for the vaccine rollout since the early fall. Uh, I, then I know we struck our team back in September or October uh, with an understanding that this has traditionally been the mandate of local public health units. So it actually came as a bit of a surprise uh, with the initial aspects of the rollout where even the provincial distribution task force did not have uh, initially on its initial announcement a local public health um, representative. Uh, so uh, the plans are already in place. I know our plan is up and available on the website for anyone who's interested, peelregion.ca forward slash coronavirus forward slash vaccine. Um, to the extent that it is the race between variants and vaccines, one of the challenges is just the supply. But uh, as Dr. Karamanting said, uh, my goal, and I've told my team this, is once we get that allocation from the province, uh, you know, and an X and Y graph, I want to make sure that that line is as parallel to the Y graph as much as possible uh, to make sure we're just getting it out there and making sure that it's making a difference and providing that protection in our community. Um, and I think, uh, you know, to the extent to the extent that we will uh, we will get there, it's kind of like you know, to paraphrase an apology to Archimedes, uh, you know, give us some vaccine and we'll, you know, move the world. And, you know, so vaccine is our lever in this case. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. I uh, know that we're running a little bit out of time. I will go back to one of the questions by Miriam Edhaya, which we have not yet had a chance to answer, at least in French. You, uh, you addressed it a little bit in English, Dr. Lowe, but what is your reaction to the fact that the vaccine rollout is going to be different in every public health unit? Is this concerning? Je pense que ça c'est une fortitude de notre système en Ontario uh, que nous avons uh, des uh, bureaux de santé publique uh, qui ont une, uh, une grande connaissance de son communauté et uh, je sais aussi que uh, nos, uh, nos bureaux de santé publique uh, étaient uh, um, en train de planifier pour cette uh, ces vaccinations uh, de, uh, depuis um, septembre, octobre uh, pour, pour nous. Et alors, j'ai uh, toutes les confiances uh, dans uh, mon unité et uh, toutes les autres unités de santé, uh, unités sanitaires uh, que uh, nous avons, nous avons uh, uh, regardé uh, de succès uh, dans le futur. Merci. Et moi, et moi je suis complètement d'accord avec ce que Dr. Lowe vient de dire. L'Ontario est une grande province avec des grandes différences dans les régions. Il y a les différences dans la densité de population, mais aussi dans les caractéristiques des populations. Il y a des différences dans les ressources des régions et les différences dans les, les gens qui donnera les vaccins actuels. Alors, donner le pouvoir aux unités de santé publique à faire les décisions, à faire la plan pour comment on fera pour 
chaque région individuelle. C'est une grande fortitude de la système. Et si on avait essayé d'avoir un plan pour tout l'Ontario, ça, ça aurait été un grand échec. Alors, pour moi, je n'ai pas de concerns là-dessus. Je pense que c'est une fortitude aussi. Having said that, um, and for those who don't speak English, we basically just said that we think it's a strength that there is this variability in plan because there are variabilities in the regions as far as resources and as far as the people who need to be involved. Um, so having said that, we are going to have to end it before we've gotten to all of the questions. My apologies. We will make sure that we get back to everyone who's asked a question in print if we haven't answered it live. I'm going to turn to each of our panelists for one last remark, and we will go in alphabetical order. So Dr. Delphin, that puts you up first. Concluding remarks, please. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me. And I think my concluding remarks, really, I would just like to emphasize that the solutions to to the issue I was talking about today, pandemic fatigue, really start, uh, are, are multifactorial and start with a lot of the very concrete solutions that you've heard about here today, that the OMA is working on, that the different public health units are working on, that the hospital is working on, and clearly communicating these and adding a, a, an additional, um, adding the additional level of really understanding where the Canadian, the Ontario population is at and coming to meet people at their needs, which means empathizing, which means understanding the hardship, acknowledging the hardship and adding solutions for people to be able to keep going and make the push to get through this, to get through this together because it's ultimately gonna be better for all of us. And it is not gonna be one person versus the other, but we're all gonna be happier and healthier in, on ev in every way to be on the other side of this. And that's gonna take working on so many different levels and working together and really, really uh, uh, understanding who the players are in terms of each individual Ontarian and what they need and how to and how to address their needs and concerns and keep on going. All right, thank you so much. Dr. Lowe is telling me he has to drop off for another interview. Is there anything you'd like to say before you're going? Just really thanks to all uh, panelists and certainly to the OMA for putting this together. Uh, I think the, you know, I would echo Dr. Dolphin's, uh, you know, thoughts. Uh, really think about just the warmer weather is coming, the vaccines are coming, we just need to hold on a little while longer. Um, and certainly, uh, if we can continue to look out for each other, particularly the most vulnerable around us, uh, the only way through this is together. So thanks. And I'm sorry that I do need to drop off now. No worries. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Dr. Kiramantang, any last comments? Quickly, just uh, really grateful for this initiative. Like I think it's brilliant, get, trying to get ahead of any concerns. I, I do want to make a, maybe a comment towards, you know, uh, uh, some of the most marginalized, racialized communities that have been affected by this, and just really emphasizing, like, as like I I see COVID regularly. I'm in the ICU. I I see the, the typical patient population. I see that multi generational home. I'm seeing you know, how a lot of racialized communities have been hit hard, whether it's through COVID directly or through the measures that we've done. So one of the things that to me is we've got to stop approaching things as doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. Really thinking about how we could reach out to these communities, specifically getting access to testing, paid leave. Like I can't, I know we keep saying it and we keep saying it because it's that important. You know what I mean? To give that person that option to be able to isolate safely and not put their loved ones at risk and not to have to make life and death decision. And until we address some of these things, you know, like we really, I don't know if we, we should be expecting a different outcome. Gratefully, the vaccines are here and they're effective. And I hope once again, we, we address hesitancy head on. But I just want to, I think it would be important to comment to, on some of our hardest hit communities and really emphasizing how important it is to put some focus on that. Absolutely. And I'll even highlight that a little bit further. I think while COVID has been demonstrated to be particularly um, disproportionately affecting certain communities, 
I don't think that's particular to COVID. I think that's a flag that we all need to remember. COVID is representing in that context, the disproportionate effect health outcomes always have in those communities every single time. And that is because of the decreased access. It's because of the socioeconomic determinants of health that are in those communities. And if we learn from COVID, perhaps what we have to learn as we move forward is that our most vulnerable communities are so vulnerable because of the actions we've taken and we have a responsibility to render them less vulnerable. Dr. Matukas, over to you. Thank you. So I think I'm going to go back to what I actually started to talk about when I was uh, when I first started um, with this panel discussion today is really to go back to the structure that we have created, which is the find, test, trace, isolate and support and again emphasize how how mutually dependent they are on on each other in order to have a successful response to this pandemic and it becomes even more critically important as we move and i can almost guarantee you that we are going to move into a third wave if we don't actually follow these critical steps and that we all play a role and i think one of the steps of, of that process that we've sort of ended with today is really the support what are we doing to ensure that we really have address that step in the process of providing the support that we need to all of those individuals and communities that have been hardest hit by that. It is completely predictable that these same communities and these same individuals will be affected again if we don't actually put in place and beef up that last step of the five-step process. I couldn't agree more. So with those comments, I will end. Thank you to everyone, all of the reporters and our panelists for attending today's briefing. Thank you for your thoughtful questions and to our esteemed panelists, thank you for your amazing responses. I hope this session is in helpful in informing your reporting. I look forward to watching and reading the coverage as always. Again, I know we didn't get to all of the questions, so we will be reaching out to you and if there's a topic you think that you would like to hear doctors discuss, please send your suggestions along to media at oma.org as we look to plan the next session. Thank you again for everyone's time. Stay safe and stay healthy.